Hello, welcome back to uh, our program, my program here, where I'm sharing about my life. In this episode, again, I share another story that I wrote after being in Japan um, and teaching in Japanese high school in the early 1990s. It was um, a very important experience in my life and really connected a lot of my interests from history, social studies, to memory, culture, uh, language, and understanding. Let me share it with you. I should first indicate that Wakari Mashta, which is in the title and repeated throughout the story, is uh, the phrase in, that in Japanese means, uh, do you understand? Okay. So it's entitled, Wakari Mashta, 30 minutes with Oji-san, Itoigawa. I taught I, and lived in Itoigawa for two years in the early 1990s. Um, it's been nearly 15 years since I began writing about the issues around international and comparative education and history and social, linguistic, and cultural understandings that's particularly affecting Japan. In that decade, the world faced the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Now we're up to our, I don't know, I guess our 60th ascent. Uh, 70th anniversary um, in the end of the war in the Pacific and in most of the Western and Eastern world um, and the end of the Holocaust. It is now almost uh, um, time to say goodbye to all of the remaining Hibaksha who died and suffered in uh, Japan in the Hiroshima bombing. Oji-san is the grandfather uh, of a family whom I did a homestay in, so it's written for him. Oji-san Itoigawa, rural Niigata, Prefecture, Japan, 1994 to today, by Kevin Stoda. Have you understood means wakarimashita in the Japanese language. Similarly, hi, wakarimashita in Japanese means yes, I have understood. One sociologist in the 1970s observed that the communication should be defined as the negotiation of meaning, that all communication should be defined as a negotiation of meaning. With such a definition, it might then be claimed that when two communicators can correctly ask, do you understand, and correctly and truthfully answer saying, I understand or I have understood that successful negotiation of meaning between them has taken place. This search for truthfully negotiated meaning between people of all cultures is what drives many individuals to learn other languages, to travel and meet people of other races in all corners of the globe, as I have done. It is the lifelong search of the main protagonist of this story in this writing. It is in this search for common or communal exchange of wakarimashita ka and hai wakarimashita that I am driven as a storyteller to show you how uh, responses to communication in different languages or cross cultures are important and affect meaning, life, love, and appreciation for one another. For this particular writing, it is however also important to note that internationalization is a movement or has been a movement in Japan similar to the multicultural movement in the United States which has had its backlash too. and. Uh, this internationalization had already enveloped the narrator's own country, but it has affected other countries around the world, especially Japan. Um, and it was the reason the author came there to live and work. For this particular writing, it is, however, important also to note that the internationalization movement actually began in Japan in the end of the Meiji period when uh, the change occurred and modernization in Japan began in the 19th century. Uh, that would be when the shoguns were kicked out of power. Uh, in the period after the restoration of the emperor in the late 1870s, uh, the Japanese, go Japanese government and private individuals en masse were encouraged for the first time in over two centuries to go outside of their own country to earn, learn language and explore the globe. Their mission was to modernize Japan and to bring modern science, cultural information, as well as educational and technical training back to their country. Within 30 years, Japan has succeeded in its mission. 
beyond the west of the world's wildest dreams. Japan's best and brightest citizens had gone out and done what no other non-European country had ever done. They, the Japanese of that era, had managed to learn about all the major scientific, industrial, and technological breakthroughs of the West. And these things had occurred over a millennia. However, the Japanese learned and studied Western literature, politics, and theater in many different languages and did this in 30 years. However, again, once all these major advances had been acquired, and were then subsequently later translated back into Japanese, the statesmen of Japan and the people of Japan either intentionally or by neglect stopped learning many foreign languages for communicative purposes, similar to the United States after the 1920s, and simply began to use English uh, and maybe some German or other languages while reading and researching, but not really to speak them. Uh, this is similar to how medical students, you know, use Latin. In other words, learning another language in Japan became simply a matter of rote learning. Students were forced to cram for an exam, but they were never asked to study the vocabulary again. Nor were they regularly asked to communicate in that foreign tongue in order to engage in any controversial or thought-provoking discussion or debate. The fact was that in Japan, Japanese schools for many decades, uh, almost nine decades of the 20th century, English and other foreign languages were taught, at, if they were taught at all, were generally taught in Jap Japan as a dead language or an unspoken tongue. And of course, except for the movies. But then again, they had uh, translations underneath with the uh, subtitles. Before the storytelling begins, it should also be noted that the narrator of most of the story goes by the name of Kansas, which means people of the south wind in one of the Native American languages of the Great Plains. The name suits the storyteller well as, like the Plains Indians of the old American West, he was blown and has traveled to many new places to set up again and again a new livelihood. That's me, of course. In his journeys, he has learned ways of living and communicating uh, in different lands, and, but he's also done this with his own personal narration, as anyone does. Kansas, after returning to his homeland, told and retold this story about what he experienced there uh, in his last days. Uh, and he returned to Japan in 1995, to see the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Kansas is fascinated by people's personal memories, as well as the collection of memories of cultures passed down through elders to their children over generations. Often during the retelling of such encounters, Kansas will ask, Kari Mashtaka, when he's talking. Hopefully you can nod sometimes and truthfully say, Hi, what Kari Mashta? So let's begin the play. Uh, be, uh, before that, I should note, the, in 1995 in Japan, Kansas had arranged a 15-day homestay with a local family uh, prior to taking a subsequent extended Japanese Golden Week uh, vacation in China. Kansas was planning to return to the U.S. in a few months to finish his master's degree in teaching English to non-native speakers. So he was very grateful for this last minute homestay in Japan. He'd asked about doing one for several years in the town where he was living. His first opportunity to stay with a more traditional three-generation Japanese household uh, provided great insight and love. Kansas needed to return home soon because he had to start his MA uh, uh, within a tie five year period. Otherwise, he would have stayed in Japan. He was getting to know the people much better and learning Japanese language. Um, Kansas was, uh, however, very frustrated during those two years by his inability to master Japanese language or dialects after living there almost two years in a rural rice-growing region. In Germany, he, he'd learned quite a bit of German in two years, so he thought it should be the same in Japanese, at least for spoken language. 
It should be no noted that prior to coming to Japan, I had also done home stays with families in Spain and Mexico as well as France, so he'd learned languages there. Two, so his expectations of learning through home stays was quite high. Uh, Kansas had gained much insight into the other cultures and the lives of individual citizens in each land. He'd begun to uh, be a lifelong diary writer. Uh, now you'd call it a blogger if you write online. In Japan, Kansas had run up against a cultural wall of sorts. Since many urban and rural Japanese live in fairly small homes, uh, which, meant, which many referred to as rabbit hutches, you know, they were so small, um, Japanese didn't feel comfortable inviting foreigners into their homes most of the time, especially uh, where they had no experience doing so. Uh, you meet people outside the home, usually you go for a picnic, uh, or some other outing with the foreigners. Uh, this was likely why uh, Kevin was not picking up, that would be Kansas me, was not picking up the language and the culture and not feeling he was uh, helping too much with the internationalization. He felt like held back and not in, inside the culture. In the seaside town of Itoigawa, a township where Kansas was living and teaching at three local public schools, there was generally more room in the size of homes than in the cities, uh, where potentially, you know, actually he could have overnighted. So there were connections uh, with his alma mater back in Kansas that enabled him to stay with some people in Niigata City. Uh, but finally, uh, the Tomie family in Itoigawa City uh, semi-adopted him for two weeks and allowed him to stay at their house in May, uh, excuse me, April 1994. Both the older male matriarch, uh, patriarchs in the household were in a kendo club and they invited him to join and participate at that time. So he learned kendo uh, prior to staying with the family. It is important to note that kendo is a Japanese martial art, which is quite similar to the form of competition that one sees in swordsmanship during the samurai period in Japan and had long ago been practiced for centuries. Uh, however, the sword of stick used in kendo is only made of wood for many obviously important reasons such as safety and for specific training purposes. Uh, the oldest resident of the Tomie family was about 82 years old. It was the Oji-san, or grandfather. Weekly, Oji-san practiced with his son, Takoshi, who was in his 50s, and others in the kendo club. Along with Oji-san and Takoshi in the Tomie household, uh, there lived uh, Takoshi's wife, Mazumi, and their four children. However, the oldest child was off to college at the time. That is why visitor's room had become free for the for Kansas to stay in. Among other things, during his stay with the Tomies, Kansas on several mornings even managed to get up around 4 a.m. to help deliver the newspapers on the family paper route. Uh, through these early morning deliveries, Kansas learned of the humility and hardworking ways of the Japanese extended household, up close. Kansas also notes as Takoshi and I, Takoshi and I delivered papers, the rising sun would begin to appear over the mountains of the summits of the western Japanese Alps, between the Itoigawa town and Nagano prefecture. During this early morning paper route activity, uh, I not only was able to enjoy the rays of the early morning sun, but I also began to feel more unity with the rhythm of life in rural Itoigawa, especially as we passed farmers heading out to the rice fields for a few hours labor before returning their homes again for breakfast, followed by their later commutes to their primary office jobs. Meanwhile, these same farmers' parents or wives would continue to work their fields or gardens till they returned later that day. Obviously, just as in America, most farmers in Japan needed a second full-time job just to get by in the postmodern world. Kansas continued, it was the shaven-headed Oji-san, the most senior member of the Tomie household, and my first kendo instructor uh, who taught me a lot, and they made me most comfortable when I came into the home. Often after returning from one of the three high schools where I taught, uh, I would open the door, I would say, Tadaima, 
which means uh, can I come in? And uh, soon I would be invited in and find myself sitting next to Oji San at the tatami mat floor uh, playing shogi with him. He was very good. I had very little skill in shogi, but he was a good teacher. Oji San would, of course, always defeat me. Uh, during these late afternoon sh shogi matches, I sipped coffee or drank Japanese tea offered to the, me graciously by Oji San. Sometimes we would watch the sumo wrestling championships going on at that time. Uh, sometimes our co conversation drifted from strategies of winning at Shogi to Kenji Oji-san's favorite topic, which was sumo wrestling, or even to other mundane household matters. Before sharing more about Oji-san, Kansas felt compelled to add, I need to explain to you that this particular spring, the high school where I was primarily teaching most uh, three days a week, was busy introducing the new oral oral English language syllabi. This meant that the students would have to finally begin using, begin to be used to hearing and listening to normal spoken ling English. Kansas continued, in early May, upon my return from the Guilin area of China, northwest of, of, northwest of Canton, which is famous for its many hills and gnome-like uh, rice uh, mountains and rice terraces and riverbeds, I began sharing my photos with Oji-san. I took them over to him and shared about China. Uh, I found myself writing monologues or dialogues for students in the classroom, too, after the trip. Uh, those years' listening exams included monologues about China, uh, whereby I shared of what I saw, the water buffalo, the oxen. Uh, this is China in the early 1990s and virtually no modern technology there at that time being employed in the rice fields of China. In comparison to Japan, where you would find uh, mountains and hills, but they would often use uh, small pedal-powered machines. Uh, by pedal, I mean uh, they were much more than a riding lawnmower. Um, to my surprise, some of the older colleagues of mine at Itoigawa High School who saw these photos of mine and the buffaloes related that when they were children, this was the way it was here or there in Itoigawa. Uh, that was not more than 30 years ago. They too had seen many of the large beasts of burden working in the fields. I was surprised because they were referring to the very fields located next to my apartment and other fields between the sea and the mountains where I bicycled often between schools. Modern Japan had left no obvious trace of this rapid transformation of mechanization and post WW to Japan is what I was finding. Wakarimashitaka, you understand. Returning to his primary tale, Kansas continues. One evening, Oji-san Takotoshi and I were chatting after dinner about the high school exams I had just written and recorded. I then told them about the pictures I was using in the oral exams. I then presented both of them with keepsakes or souvenirs from the area in China I had been in photos and, and other gifts. I had bought these objects in Southwest Guilin, and my soon-to-be homestay families uh, were especially happy. As I explained the meaning of the gifts to them, Oji-san's room, I, was, uh, I of course had to slip off my shoes, and uh, he replied, Irishai, after I said Tadaima, and uh, we got back on the Tadami mat floor again. Oji-san motioned to me to sit down and take some tea. I nodded my head. He nodded that he would too. And he'd like to look at my photos. I then quickly sat down to Oji-san with a packet of photos in my hand and I politely turned to him in my stumbling Japanese and asked ever so indirectly, Takatoshi said you were in China. With this indirect statement, I was implying, where in China did you go as a soldier? that Oji-san would have served in 1940s in, in China. And uh, would you have seen these water buffalo and similar to what I've seen? Soon Oji-san began to speak with a strong feeling and emotion, but I'm not sure what he said. Uh, Kansas sensei he had a terribly lot to say, Oji-san did. He tried with all his energy to follow the ancient gentleman's words in Japanese. Kansas tried his best. To interpret what what was shared or what could be shared. Eventually, 
Kansas began to slip the photos back into the albums as he came to become fairly frustrated by the long narration that was obviously so important to him and the older men. Oji-san proceeded to tell a very long tale and provide many details and insights which were forever to remain beyond my ability to comprehend. That is because my Japanese was too poor, Kansas explained. This frailty in my comprehension of Oji-san's Japanese was because I had come to Japan with virtually no previous Japanese language experience. Even after 20 months, I, I felt myself to be rather low level, uh, and uh, I'd even tried to take a train 100 kilometers back and forth for one day a week, a little long, as well as getting other uh, tutoring in the area. Uh, but it hadn't uh, been enough, and it had been too tiresome after work to go by train back and forth. At this juncture, Kansas also felt compelled to explain, I am trained as a historian as well as a teacher of foreign languages. That is why, since my earliest days, I had begun to learn the methodology of recording oral histories from often elderly citizens, like in the United States. Uh, the tales from the 1950s civil rights era was uh, those on globalization and how life has changed since the 1940s, or even uh, war-torn um, Germany or war uh, United States, what it was like back then. Um, after completing my undergraduate studies, I conducted Horace oral histories in both German and English yeah, on two different continents. Um, I also did similar oral interviews when I was doing homestays in Mexico, France, Spain, and Germany. In each of those homestay situations, I was at least able to write in my diary later what I believed they were able to tell me. Uh, but after living so long in Japan, I was anywhere near that level. More importantly, um, the only improvement of my Japanese had been that I had courage to sit with friends, to approach friends and ask that they help me with Japanese, like Oji-san was trying to do. Uh, Kansas noted, nonetheless, despite all my prior preparations, I now found myself in an all too familiar situation. Oji-san was talking away in a 30 minute long monologue saying things I would ever and very much want to understand. Therefore, I was becoming very deeply frustrated by his inability to be focused and to explain slowly. Nevertheless, Gabarimashita, I continued to try my best to comprehend. As he continued with his own narration, Kansas smiled. Slowly, I was able to decipher or glean much of the following from Oji-san. Even as my mind wandered back and forth uh, across several continents, remembering similar situations, dating back to the first time I lived on the farm in uh, the Alsatian re region of France back in the 1980s and did a homestay with an Alsatian-speaking family in rural France. Wakarimashita-ka? Wakarimashita-ka? Oji-san explained, when I first went to China, my ship landed at Shanghai, but soon my troops moved in an isolated region in the mountains. Kansas thought this moment was for me like one of those off-stated deja vus. I'm sitting here saying hi to Oji-san, but I don't quite grasp what's going on. I'm grasping at straws at least, trying to figure out what's going on. Years ago, in my, during my first exchange program abroad, I was involved in at the Alsatian farm, which was located only three meters from Switzerland. I was there in the winter of 1983-1984. Normally the family there whom I was living with spoke French and German dialects amongst themselves. That is, they spoke primarily formal German to me, though, however, prior to going to live and work in that land, I had never studied either French or German, so I wasn't very good and wasn't seeming to pick it up fast, but I did pick it up within six months. Uh, in my high school days in my home state of Kansas, I had had no opportunity to learn a foreign language. And that's why, for me, teaching a foreign language to others has been very important. So uh, Sterling, Kansas, where I went to high school in the 1970s, had no foreign language class at all. Uh, when I went to college, I took some Spanish, but I could barely do anything in them at that time in my undergraduate days. But later I did go abroad and did homestays where I learned a lot of Spanish. 
On this farm in rural France, as in rural Japan, I had no access to regular language courses. However, on this Alsatian farm, my life seemed and was particularly isolated in France, as there was not even a television in the family room in the 1980s there. As several members of the French Alsatian Wenger family, it was the family Wenger I was staying with, painstakingly attempted to teach me uh, German. And through a lot of stress and hard working and daily practice, I lived and worked with them and began to decipher by the end of the time there that they don't actually speak either German or French on that farm. They speak Alsatian. Um, I did ask Aunt Lily, Tita Lily, uh, Wanger's family, uh, or Tanta uh, Lily, Wanger's family, uh, about why they would invite a foreigner to come live in their rural farm, like myself, uh, to come and work with their dairy animals and as part of this international program. It, was it simply to get cheap foreign labor or something? No, Tanta Lili nodded that that was of help, but the real reason she pointed out through the icy snow-covered front door window, uh, the shed across the way had been occupied by German soldiers, most of World War II, as was the entire farm. Tanta Lili explained even more slowly, Wir können es nicht mehr leisten von dem Außenwelt weiter nicht zu wissen. That is, we can't afford it, it any longer to know too little about what is happening outside, outside our borders. Kansas added, such situations or experiences like that afternoon with Tata, Tata Lidi in uh, France uh, trying to discuss life on that farm uh, in the Nazi era or even earlier uh, was a problem because I lacked the vocabulary and skills. And it's the same with Ojisan that day. I had wanted Tata Lili to discuss more of her interest in the wider world. I had wanted to know if the WW2 had impacted her family in Switzerland. She was in, born in Switzerland. Her husband, Uncle Fritz, was born in France. Um, but Uncle Fritz was forced under German occupation to uh, learn German. And so he was pretty good at formal German. Tata Lili back in Swiss, uh, the German Swiss part of uh, Switzerland, of course, she uh, had learned more formal German. Uh, it was practiced in the family, uh, uh, they were Mennonite families, to go uh, to Switzerland to get married. In that way, their children were considered Swiss. My, uh, uh, the people who were working on the farm my age all had Swiss passports, uh, so that they did not have to do military service in uh, France at that time. Wakari um, Mashtaka. Two months earlier, before I came to live in Ojisan's house, Kansas added, uh, I took an all night train ride south to the Hiroshima region. There I'd found myself, Hiroshima region, I'm sorry, I'd found myself in, in similar situations there too. The first of these incidents took place in the town of Miyajima, across the waters and only stone's throw from the famous temple island of the same name, Miyajima. My plans on that long journey had been to visit Hiroshima and Miyajima over one long weekend. However, I ended up staying two days and later the second of two memorable encounters occurred. They would send me up river, up river further to the famous bridge at Iwakuni. Upon arrival in Hiroshima, I had feasted on an order of Hiroshima-style yakisoba, a local specialty, and then checked in exhausted at a local youth hostel. The very next morning, I headed with all my belongings to Heiwa Koen, or the Hiroshima International Peace Park. As I got off the bus, the hauntingly uh, famous Hiroshima Dome arose in the distance. The city's world-famous surviving nuclear bombing landmark beckoned me at a relatively quiet hour of the day. Kansas recalled, luckily no hordes of Japanese high school students were yet 
of being paraded about the grounds at 8.15 in the morning, approximately the time of the day when the U.S. Enola Gay had dropped its atomic device on the city of Hiroshima. I was impressed by how quiet or reflective the whole place was at that moment as I walked the streets and uh, parked and crossed the bridge, which had been located at Ground Zero on August 6, 1945. I was stopped on the bridge for at least a half hour. I had to gaze at the dome's reflection on the water, and, and while basking in the glow of the sunny morning, but relatively cool morning, I took pace, uh, attention, my attention to the pace of the city. Uh, the pace was picking up as more and more residents went off to work that morning. After observing the growing tide of visitors uh, in the park then, I began to take photographs. I finally arrived at the museum and uh, spent most of the day there. Not only is the death, suffering, and the cancer of survivors and victims documented there, but also observations are made on the way of life in wartime Japan, when its citizens, children, and others were in forced labor day after day after day. One exhibition in the museum noted that many child laborers were used in the war. Later, back outside in the Peace Park, I came across some memorials to the children who had been abused by being forced to labor for industries in Japan during the last years of the horrible war. Kansas continued with the story. The visit to the Peace Park and Museum left me somber and feeling very heavy too. As I came out of the museum grounds around noon, I determined to do something more uplifting and therefore headed out on the tram to Miyajima town. From Miyajima port, I quickly took a boat across to the gorgeous island and to its many uh, temples, which also beckoned many more Japanese students who are juniors in high school. The juniors in high school all, from all over Japan go each year to Hiroshima Park uh, or Hiroshima Koen and Miyajima Jo or Temple. As noted above, uh, Kansas's hobby is photography, so he subsequently spent most of the afternoon and the early morning taking photos around the beautiful estuary where Miyajima Island is situated as the tide was going out Later, Kansas walked among the temples and shrines and even hiked to the top of the mountain, which enabled nice views out into the rest of the archipelago. Around dusk, uh, Kansas hiked back down to the boat harbor after asking uh, most tourists their direction and their way back to the mainland. This had left uh, the island to its main residence, which is our tame deer. With the stars overhead, Kansas took one of the last boats back towards Hiroshima. He then trudged up the hill to Miyajima Youth Hostel and checked in again. Famished, he soon headed immediately back towards the port to a restaurant that had a sign posted serving local specialty, mussels. Mm -hmm. Kevin loved mussels. He learned to eat them when he was in Belgium years before. Uh, there was a cure for you in the hospital, so he was in a hurry. Kansas continued, I hadn't stopped to eat all day. I was famished. So at 8.30, I found myself at the Izakaya ordering two small meals, including a side order of local scallops and beer. As I was eating, I began to write in my journal. Suddenly, a haggard man in his 50s and wearing a nice suit motioned to me to take a seat across from him. So I moved over to him. Kansas added, I should note that in Japan it is not uncommon at all for total strangers to sit down at a table to, to eat together. I suppose that is because it is a very highly populated country and personal space is uh, not as important for eating and traveling as it is for Americans. I ordered a second beer as the tired man sitting across from me drank his beer along with his meal. As we drank together, he introduced himself as Mr. Yamanaka. At first, he spoke to me a little in his broken English, but when he discovered that I was teaching um, in Japan, in uh, high schools, he uh, asked me to participate more. He then asked me why I was in uh, Hiroshima. His next question was, of course, whether I had gone to see the Peace Park and the Genbaku Dome. Genbaku Dome means the Hiroshima Dome. 
since I had just jotted it down in my diary, some of my day, I, some of my day's events, I turned to my diary and recited the whole list of things I had done along that day, along with my feelings I had experienced. I did my best to share this in Japanese. Yamanaka-san then inquired whether I would like to drink some sake. Japanese rice rang with him. I indicated that I would. Later, Yamanaka-san looked thoughtfully at his watch and asked me whether I had enough time to go home with him for about an hour before my youth hostel closed for the night. Yamanaka-san said he would love to introduce me to his family. I told him the exact time the curfew and the, at the hostel would begin and I asked him how we could get to his house. Mr. Yamanaka stated by taxi and his home was only six or seven minutes away. So within a few minutes, uh, still feeling a bit high from the alcohol, we were being whisked through the streets by taxi, further a higher set of hills above me at Jima Town. I marveled at my host-to-be's hospitality. At the genkan of his abode, I politely took my shoes off as is custom in Japan. Just as Yamanaka-san shouted, Tadaima, for I'm at home, the new Kocho sensei then of mine turned to me and explained to his wife how he had come to have a surprise guest that night. Next, Yamanaka-san shouted for both his father and his son, who happened to be home from college on spring break, to come and sit down with me. Within seconds, we were in the family dai dokoro, or kitchen, and seated at the table. We drank more sake and chatted excitedly. Yamanaka's oji-san nodded to me with a big half toothless smile. He, he was very short, chubby, with long white hair. This Oji-san must have been in his 80s and at that moment appeared to be the most overtly excited individual in the room. Slowly, Oji-san began to ask me several relatively simple Japanese questions. Suddenly, another elderly person entered the room. This turned out to be Oji-san's wife, Oba-san. And the tiny um, ancient lady sat beside her husband and spoke much more quietly than her energetic spouse. Uh, just then her own son had had done to me earlier. Um, Yamanaka Soji-san asked me what I had been up to that day. I then proceeded to tell him some of the tales about Hiroshima and Miyajima, which I had shared with Yamanaka-san earlier. Then, with the blessing of alcohol hanging over all of us, I boldly asked whether Oji-san had witnessed the Genbakudon, or the atomic explosion, some 50 years earlier. Yamanaka's Oji-san shook his head. No, he replied, and then winked in the direction of his wife. He explained that he had been assigned to the Japanese Railroad Commission to spend the duration of the war in China running the railroad during the occupation there. Then, with a chuckle that caught me off guard, Oji-san added, however, that his wife, Obachan, had lived in Hiroshima at the time, though only a few kilometers from the epicenter of the blast at ground zero from the Enola Gay atomic bomb. He added that is why he called Obachan, his little wife, Genbaku Chan. Chan is the diminutive form of san in Japanese, so it means little one. So we jokingly called his, he jokingly called his wife, my little atomic bomb girl. Genbaku means atomic bomb. My mouth dropped, shared Kansas. I could hardly believe how special this encounter was turning out to be. However, as I tried to communicate with these two octogenarians in Japanese, I struggled ever so much. As the son and the grandson offered to try and help me comprehend or translate what the octogenarians were telling me about their history. Finally, I formulated one question which I was curious about. Do any members of your family suffer from bomb-related diseases? I mean, nuclear bomb-related diseases, like leukemia. All three generations of this family shook their heads no. My mouth dropped again in amazement that the evil of the bomb had passed over all three generations of these Hiroshima district residents. You mean that all generations of your family who have been living here in Hiroshima are sitting in front of me and none of you are suffering any related disease? I thought, this is all certainly a miracle. By this time, it was getting fairly late. Kansas had uh, 
re reached the other limits of his Japanese language skills and needed to run and make his curfew back at the youth hospital in Mijima. He said, I was frustrated, but I could not have probed any deeper into this Japanese family singular experiences in the post-atomic era of modern Japan. I would have liked to have known so much. Even though all our tongues were loosened by Alpha Hall, I had not acquired the Japanese training and I needed to follow through. I would certainly have loved to have learned so much more. All kinds of questions passed through my head in English, but how to put them in Japanese, that is a different endeavor. Finally, as I readied to leave the Yamanaka family, I simply allowed the conversation to turn to lighter topics. And soon as we all parted, I said goodnight to, Yama, to the Yamanaka family. I was quickly driven back to my hostel, hostel for the night by another member of the Yamanaka family. What wonderful and special hosts they were. Wakaremashitakai. I should say, all the time I was staying with the Otomi family, um, Oji-san was my most common partner there. That's Oji san means grandfather. Um, he tried to tell me more about what he'd experienced in China. On a short patrol through those Chinese mountains, my fellow troops and I got pinned down on a hill. We were stuck in a crossfire for seven whole days. We hadn't brought enough food, but for a single day. Worse, we had no extra water. We suffered horribly. We thought we were done for. One week, though, we were there. And then finally, the shooting stopped. By this, by this time, I was very weak. Soon, I caught malaria. That much Kansas could understand, he was, but he was greatly frustrated. He said, am I missing too many key ideas from Oji-san? Um, then returned my interest in memory and I began to share about my trip to Miyajima and the family I met there. At the bridge, uh, I should say on the very next day, I took a trip up to the bridge at Iwakuni. My father had been there just after the war in the 1950s. And a friend of his uh, was stationed at Iwakuni. But there's a famous bridge there. Uh, I hope to show you a picture of it in a minute, uh, which I'd read about in the guidebook. This famed architecture wonder is a five arched pedestrian bridge made of wood. It is one of the more beautiful examples of classical oriental arch architecture I've ever seen. After wandering ab about along the river, of Iwakuni uh, and seeing it from all kinds of historical angles uh, and taking pictures of the cherry blossoms and uh, private gardens there. I walked further upstream. I came upon a picnic table situated in front of a small restaurant which had not yet opened. Therefore, Kansas walked over to a vending machine and bought a can of orange juice and sat down. From there, he could see uh, things such as the bridge and do his journaling and continue to admire uh, that beautiful spring morning. Also along the banks of the river just below him where he was riding there were some smaller gardens. The sun shone uh, pleasantly that cool spring morning. Kansas uh, continued his tale and said I was sitting and writing some sentences down describing the view of the bridge and the surrounding scenery as well as jotting down a short description of the events from the previous night, explaining more about the Yamanaka family or what I could remember of it. Suddenly, there was a uh, noise from the elderly man working in his garden below me. And the man then proceeded to come walking in my direction. It soon became clear that he owned the restaurant behind me and wanted to get me some uh, bite. The elderly gardener subsequently took off his gardener's hat, or casa, and started uh, startled me by uh, speaking in fairly clear English. The restaurant owner then asked me several questions. However, he quickly seemed to run out of things to say in English. His vocabulary was very small. 
So we both switch over to speaking some Japanese and uh, make sure these two tongues, which is commonly referred to jokingly as Japlish. Uh, what is the name of the river flowing in front of us? Delray native uh, replied with a slow pronunciation, Nishikigawa. Then he crouched to the ground and began to write the Japanese or Chinese symbols or kanji in the dirt. He thus spelled out the three parts of the river's name in Chinese symbol. Next, the man wrote the pronunciation for each of these symbols in Roman letters or Romanji below. Kansas uh, was interested and he said in his notes, the elderly restaurant owner and gardener asked Kansas if he were an American soldier because of his short hair uh, Kansas indicated that he wasn't. Then because um, he'd not often met men of this age in rural areas of Japan who were willing to try and speak uh, Japanese with him or English or Japanese as he, this man had been willing to do, Kansas boldly asked him whether he had been a soldier abroad during the war. He shook his head, indicating that he had not been abroad in World War II. However, later as a young man, it had been required of him at a special local high school for adults that he learned spoken English. Due to the presence of the former occupying American military base nearby in Iguacuni town. Even now, decades later, there's still an American military base situated there, and it's called Iwakuni. Kansas noted all this, and, and then at that moment, it occurred to him that he should ask the man where he was when uh, the Genbokodon, or the uh, Hiroshima bomb was. Was he still a boy in the last days of the Second World War? When Kansas asked the elder man, the man responded, Hi! He had certainly been right here when the Genbaku Dawn occurred. He spent his childhood during in the Japanese imperialist war years going to high school, working on local farms and fishing right here in Iwakuni at the Nishikigawa River, passing right in front of us, below us. Next, I mentioned that I had been to the Peace Park in Hiroshima the day before, so I was wondering if he had actually seen the bomb explode. The old man replied to me in surprise, hi. He had been working in the garden below us that very morning on August 6, 1945. Out of the corner of his eye, he'd seen the pika, or great light, a few seconds later, he heard the dong, a great explosion. This aged Japanese man in front of me was telling me that pika dong meant atomic explosion. Kansas had just met an eyewitness to atomic history's birth at Hiroshima. Kansas remarked, finally, the survivor was asked whether Many people had fled his home village from Hiroshima after the Picadon. The Japanese man said something, but uh, Kansas is not sure what he meant. He thought that perhaps uh, he knew a lot of people affected by the bomb. Later, as Kansas was departing them that day from Iwakuni, the old man sh spoke again. The man shared that he was nearly 80 years old now, but did not expect to live much longer. Kansas told him, uh, that he was still very young. This old Oji-san was very young. Kansas explained that his Obachan, a little old grandmother of his back in America, had just gotten married at the age of 80. She was now 19 years old, and she was still together with her new husband. Kansas also again promised to come back to Iwakuni in the future, visit and chat with the elderly man again sometime. Perhaps in a decade, I will come right back here looking for you under that tree in front of you in your restaurant. The old man nodded and replied, Hi, Otarimashita. I will stop for now. I hope you appreciate this story. I have many more to share in future days. Uh, this one, uh, again, is called Otarimashita. And I hope you like it and enjoy the images in the background as I read it to you. I'll take a pause.